Hello, I'm Mypo Swords, and today we're going to be doing a conservative restoration of this. This is a Qajar era sword from Iran. It is of the so-called revival type. That is to say, it has aspects which are supposed to evoke earlier Iranian swords, like the downturned beast head quillons, and other features that are somewhat in common with swords of the region. The hilt construction differs from a lot of typical Iranian swords that we see earlier, being one piece of steel. The blade is likewise also steel, and it is very elaborately etched, which is something that we will be able to see a lot better after the restoration. In order to restore this sword in an ethical, responsible, and reasonable manner that doesn't cause any degradation to the overall condition of this antique sword, I'm going to be following a relatively recent protocol as published in the articles that I've linked in the description. The method I'm going to be using is chelation with EDTA. EDTA is a pretty strong chelating agent, especially where things like iron are concerned. It is, however, also pretty selective, so it's going to be much more reactive with the iron oxide compared to the iron itself. This protocol is mostly developed for use in things like copper-based alloys. At least the two articles I've found have used EDTA in that context. One of the articles uses a gel, or hydrogel in this case agar, with potassium nitrate in order to perform electrolysis of an iron artifact. However, I am choosing to go a different route and I'm going to rely entirely on the chelation ability of the EDTA as I don't particularly want to be using electricity and uh, electrolysis on this example. This example is roughly 130 to 180 years old. It is relatively recent and is still in relatively acceptable condition. It has corrosion, but it's not excessive. And in fact, there are areas which are not particularly heavily corroded. I do have other examples which are more heavily corroded and made of different types of steel, such as crucible steel. And in the future, if this protocol proves to be effective, I will be using it for them. I will say that despite the articles being relatively recent in the use of EDTA hydrogels for ferrous artifacts, the use of EDTA itself as a chelating agent for restoring things like swords isn't new. There's actually a commercial product known as Evaporust, which has been used quite successfully for this by other people, including Matt Easton, who once did a video on it. The primary ingredient in uh, Evaporust, according to its material safety data sheet, is EDTA, and that is the active ingredient. It has other proprietary ingredients, which might aid in things like wetting it out, or increasing the ability for it to adhere to a or, or conform to a surface, but the primary active ingredient is EDTA. There are alternative things I could use in a hydrogel in order to restore this sword. One of the things mentioned in a recent article is the use of oxalic acid in a hydrogel, and that's something I've explored before for using oxalic acid on pattern welded swords, and it's something I might explore in the future when it's relevant. But for this, we are just going to be using EDTA. The exact formulation we're going to use isn't precisely one of the ones which is stipulated in either of these papers. While they use 3% uh, agar and 2% EDTA by weight, and 3% agar and 5% EDTA by weight, I'm going to keep it even and just do 3% and 3%, somewhere in the middle of the range, as I believe this will be quite well suited to use on a ferrous artifact. The artifacts they were looking at were typically copper alloys. Anyway, let's go weigh out some ingredients and then we'll move over to the workbench where we're going to begin. I've pre-weighed roughly 94 milliliters of water here and it's at roughly 50 degrees Celsius. And that's going to be our starting temperature in order to create this agar gel mixture. I'm going to add three grams of agar and then three grams of EDTA and then we're going to microwave it until we hit a roughly 95 degree internal temperature, which I'll be checking with a digital thermometer. So we now have 
three grams of agar, and we're going to add another three in EDTA. And there we have 100 grams total. We're going to stir this, then we're going to microwave it in short spurts, checking the temperature every so often until we hit our desired 95 degree temperature. And we have heated up our agar gel solution to the requisite 95 degrees Celsius. Now we're actually going to let it cool back down to room temperature and heat it up again, as the paper notes that twice heated gel has better properties. And I am actually going to top it off so that it is 100 milliliters again, because we've lost a little bit due to evaporation. We are back and our agar gel has set up completely. Its first heating has been completed, and it's now time to bring it back up to 95 degrees Celsius. It's worth noting that while the gel is hot, it is very fluid. It's only when it cools down that it becomes gel-like. In order to apply this, first what we're going to do is clean the blade with some alcohol wipes. Ordinarily, I do this with just straight isopropyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol and some cotton buds, but I don't have cotton buds right now, so we're using prepackaged alcohol wipes. The purpose of this is just to make sure there's nothing that will interfere with the binding of the agar gel to the blade. No leftover residues that could cause chemical interference with the various different bonds that agar forms. Now, agar gel is particularly useful because it increases the amount of time that we are exposing the active ingredient, EDTA, to the iron oxide. If you just use a liquid, it's going to roll off the blade and need constant reapplication, and you end up using a lot more of your reagents than you need to. Not only that, but because it runs off, you risk inconsistent or streaky finishes as a result. Now, this particular blade, as I alluded to in the intro, is a so-called Qajar Revival Blade, and it's from modern-day Iran. These revival blades are typically associated, at least according to Arms and Armour of Iran by Khorasani, with the festival of, or rather the commemoration of, Ashura. During Ashura, there is typically a reenactment of the Battle of Karbala, and it is in this reenactment that these swords were used. As a result, they typically have religious motifs engraved on them in the form of Quranic inscriptions, but also animal forms, foliate forms, battle scenes, and in many cases, there are serpents on them. This one does have serpents on it, and so does my other example. You'll note that this is a saber, and that is rather unusual for these Qajar Revival swords. Most of them are straight swords, and in fact, my other example is also a straight sword. There's a rather famous Qajar era straight sword depicted in a painting, and that painting is the Battle of Grunwald, or Bidva pod Grunwaldem, by Jan Mateko. That painting is a lot later than the battle it depicts, and it actually uses a Kadra era straight sword in the hands of who I believe is a Lithuanian prince, but I will have to check back on that, and if I'm wrong, I'll have it overlaid on the video. Regardless, that sword could not have existed in 1410 when the Battle of Grunwald happened, and the sword itself, the physical object, not the one depicted in the painting, can still be seen in a museum in Krakow, and I actually took some photos of it so I could compare it to the one in the painting, and it is the same one. That Kadra era straight sword is particularly unique because it has fullers and an almost diamond cross section. Most of them don't have those features. In fact, the vast majority of them are pretty flat. Now, I'm just checking the viscosity of this gel and it seems like it should do the job. It is semi-fluid, but not particularly runny. And the more it cools, the stiffer it gets. We're going to be applying it using brand new, unused nylon paintbrushes, because they shouldn't react with anything, they are cheap, and they allow very good control when applying it. I'm going to let this dry for just a moment for all of that solvent to evaporate off. 
and then we're going to start with a couple of test spots. It's worth noting I'm wearing gloves for this entire process, but that's not strictly necessary. These are not particularly toxic chemicals. There are alternatives to agar which are much more toxic. Polyacrylamide, if I remember correctly, is a potent neurotoxin, for example, so you would definitely want to be wearing gloves for that. You might see me change gloves occasionally because, working with a sword, it's rather sharp, and sometimes you develop holes. So I'm going to exchange this while we wait for that to cool down. Alright, in order to do a test etch on this, I'm going to start on an area that's more heavily corroded, but still relatively inconspicuous, and that's right here near the spine. I'm going to just dip the edge of my paintbrush in this rapidly gelling mixture, remove any excess on the side, and put a rather small 3 by 5 millimeter dot of the gel on here, but in an appropriate thickness, in order to simulate how it will be used on the rest of the blade. I'm not particularly looking for an immediate reaction here, because that's not the way these gels behave. This is a chelating agent, and while EDTA may be technically an acid, we are not relying on acidity to do the work here for us. We are relying on chelation, which is an entirely different process. Now, there is a tiny bit of runover onto the sides of the sword, but that's not a concern because we plan to restore this entire sword. So I'm going to see if this works, and I'll be back in just a moment. So we are back, we've waited for a little while, and now I am just going to wipe off the gel and see if there's been any change. And it would appear that we haven't yet had a change, but we also haven't damaged the blade in any way. Now I expect this is going to take a while to take action because it is using chelation. So there's a fair chance that I haven't left the sample on for long enough. But if I look at this, the gel has actually taken on a red color. So I know that some action is occurring. Having determined that and using the papers that we're using as a basis for this experiment, I'm going to proceed to heat this up so it's nice and warm, apply it on the blade, in small sections, and we're going to see if we can't reverse some of the rust that exists on this sword. Now, the hilt on this is where the majority of the corrosion is. I would, however, like to leave that until last because it's the hardest part to handle, having many angles and having nooks and crannies that we have to work around. So I'm actually going to start with the distal portion of the blade at the tip. So let me just reverse this sword and we can start. I'm not sure how well you can see it. It's actually a rather large patch of corrosion here, and that's going to be one of our primary goals. So I'm going to do, let's say, half of the length of the Yelman, and then we'll move on afterwards. And if there's any unevenness at the end, I'm going to address that by doing a, a final run with a dilute solution just in order to even out the surface finish. Although I suspect it probably won't be much of an issue. Now, as we're applying this, you're gonna notice that I'm gonna be going over the same areas a couple of times. And that's because I'm trying to get a sufficient thickness. And that helps us in a couple of different ways. The thinner the solution is, the less of it there is. So the less active ingredient we get. And the thicker it is, the more gel is sitting above it, so the better inhibition we get of outside oxygen. And that's rather important as we want to be converting the rust away and not allowing a liquid medium for dissolved oxygen to reach the steel and promote further rusting. Now, there's a very large temperature differential between the gel, which is at the moment around 70 degrees, because I just heated it up, and the blade, which is room temperature and is also made of steel. So it has a very different thermal coefficient to the water. As a result, the moment I am touching the tip of this paintbrush to the blade, it is gelling up quite rapidly. As a result, 
the gel is not spilling off the blade, nor is it spilling around the edges in order to reach the other side of the blade. And that means that we can stay relatively localized in our applications to one surface of the blade. Now, I mentioned this while I was using the alcohol, the ethyl alcohol wipes, but surface preparation is relatively important. And there are a couple of different ways you could have handled surface preparation if you were doing this yourself. One way you could have started is by using very mild abrasives. You could have started with micro chiseling or micro blading of the iron oxide, the rust, or perhaps you could have started with something like CO2 blasting, that is to say, dry ice blasting. All of those, however, require you to use a stereo microscope, in particular, a stereo inverted microscope, that is to say that the light source is above the sample, not under it. And I do not have a stereo inverted microscope, and the one that I have found is roughly 2000 US dollars. So it might be a while until YouTube revenue justifies purchasing that. Now, there is a slight color change already occurring. We are losing some of the brightness of this blade. And that is going to happen no matter what chemical conversion method you use. Whether you were to try and use oxalic acid to do this, or whether you were going to use electrolysis to do this with potassium nitrate as an electrolyte, you are going to incur some change in the finish. Whether you choose to pursue a higher polish at the end of this process after the gel has had its time to work is largely up to you. And there are cultural differences of opinion in whether you should repolish an antique blade after having done restoration work. In Japan, it is extremely common to repolish antique swords to the point where it is the de facto standard and there is an entire industry around the Tugishi or repolisher. In the Western world, that is somewhat more uncommon. In fact, it's so uncommon that there is precisely one paper that I've found which details the use of those Japanese repolishing methods on antique European blades. And that paper looks at a couple of, I believe, German swords from around the 10th century, but I would have to check. I am probably going to employ a very mild polishing regime on this just in order to bring back contrast between the highlights and the lowlights. That is to say, to be able to see the calligraphy better. I haven't decided on exactly what process I'm going to use, as it's going to depend on the result of this removal of the corrosion products. Depending on how well the corrosion products are removed, and depending on the finish at the end of it, we will have a different work surface, a different surface texture, that requires repolishing. As this gets to work, I'm going to explain a tiny bit more about the, the history of these Iranian swords in general, because you might not be familiar with this particular form. I know when I first encountered them, I wasn't. So in Iran, the, the word for sword is shamshir, and you might be familiar with the original shamshir, as you might consider it, being a heavily curved sword with a horn, ivory, or wood grip a pommel cap, and a guard. That isn't really the, the first distinctly Iranian sword. If we go back further, for example, to the Sassanid dynasties, the Sasanians, we see long, straight, single-edged and double-edged swords with a so-called pistol grip. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has a very spectacular example with a full gilded scabbard. And I'm going to have that on screen now. But that is somewhat of our origin of Iranian swords. It goes further back into the Bronze Age, but for the design characteristics, the, the evolution we're looking at, we really have to look at Iron Age and beyond. And from a rather early point, they were using crucible steel to make these swords, and at some point they started making their own crucible steel in at least three or four locations, with varying chemistries in each of those locations. There is a shift somewhere around the 16th century from predominantly using those earlier straight swords to predominantly using heavily curved swords. But the introduction of the curve is relatively gradual. The curved sword, the saber, is typically thought to have come from nomadic Turkic tribes and steppe people. 
and the, the use of the sword on horseback in the method which they use promotes the use of cutting, and so a curved sword makes it easier to achieve their goals. These were initially relatively shallowly curved swords, and most of them had relatively narrow blades. Examples like the, the Avar sabers and other Eurasian steppe sabers are what came to Iran and were slowly developed into the domestic designs. But it wasn't an immediate switch. By the time of my other Iranian Shamshir, which is on screen now, the, the form was very well established. But this was probably the, the peak of curvature with a narrow blade. As we go further on in history, into the 1700s and beyond, we typically get slightly less curved blades and slightly broader blades. Around this time is also when we start seeing the, the Yelman, the sharpened false edge, appearing on both Iranian but especially on Turkic swords. And those Turkic swords are what really kicked off the popularity of the Yelman. There are Iranian swords with very defined flared false edges that are sharpened in the Turkish style. In fact, there's an entire style of what I would call an Iranian pala, and I'm going to have an antique example of that on screen now. They are distinctly different to the Ottoman pala, but they do often have these downturn quillons, and that, I suspect, is why these are called revival swords because they integrate aspects like the downturned quillons, which were present on the older swords. I can't actually read either Farsi or Arabic, so I don't know what the inscriptions on this blade are. I don't know if there's some form of uh, Kuthic inscription or, what's the other one, Kulof, Kulath inscription. I do know that they are a running theme throughout these Qajar revival swords, whether you're talking the straight ones or the curved ones. But they are also similar to some Qajar Shamshir of a more typical style, particularly the export ones for Arab areas. These will often have a panel in this portion of the blade, which is done in a very similar style of etched calligraphy, which is in stark contrast to the earlier style of calligraphy, which tended to be applied via Kofgari or via true inlay methods. Now, bringing your attention back to this blade, I'm going to shift it into the light a little so that you can hopefully see that we do have some color change occurring on this portion of the blade. Now, at some point, we are going to want to remove this gel, but that is once we see a definitive removal of the rust. But you can see along the edge that we're seeing an orange color. And this orange color is indicative of the process of uh, conversion of that rust. It is being dissolved into the gel. I'm going to make sure that none of that edge is actually exposed because if it's exposed it is simply reacting with air and not with the gel as we intend. This might require a little bit of over application of the gel onto the sides. However, as we're going to be doing both sides of this blade and then doing an evening run, it should be okay to have a small amount of excess applied onto the edges. You might be wondering why I didn't result to a purely abrasive method in order to remove all of this corrosion, because I suspect most of you are looking at this and thinking that it would be a lot easier to simply use, for example, a scrubbing pad and some jeweler's rouge in order to remove all the corrosion. But this blade is covered in text, and I would like to preserve the fidelity of that text to the utmost extent that is physically and humanly possible. So I am using an extremely mild and extremely slow method and working in small portions. The fact that I'm working in small portions does slow down the process even more. But if I was doing the whole blade at once, I wouldn't be able to keenly observe and check for small issues like the delamination of the gel from the blade that we just noted a moment ago. We there is a thin layer of red oxidation on either end of where we've applied this gel. And that indicates to me that it's probably about time that we peel off this gel layer. This is one of the benefits cited in the paper which I took this process from. Because this gel, this agar gel, does set, it is peelable. So you can rapidly remove it in case you need to, in case you've 
run out of time, something's going wrong, it needs to be reapplied, or it has simply finished its course. So I'm going to be using a simple plastic knife, the back of it, which can't scratch anything, it is far softer than the steel. And I'm going to simply remove this piece, and then we'll see if we need to reapply, or if we are ready to move on to another section. One thing you will note is that if I turn this over, we haven't had very much spillover onto the other side of the blade, whereas if we we're using a liquid, it would have pulled underneath pretty significantly. So let's just peel away that entire layer and the whole thing comes off. And as you can see, there is a rather stark difference in color, but also all of this rust, which was once relatively red or brown, is now black. We can see that the process has been effective by the fact that this entire piece of gel is discolored in an orangish color, which means it's been absorbing ferric oxide or iron oxide. And now it simply goes into a glass dish for disposal. Now I am going to clean this up with an alcohol wipe once again to see if anything comes off. And that will tell us how effective the treatment has been before we proceed. That is a pretty substantial amount of iron oxide that is on this alkyl wipe. And there's more to be removed, clearly. But you'll note that the bright orange edge that was on either end of the gel came off with the gel and has not marred the surface of the sword. Now it is looking like some of that corrosion is still present on this sword. However, that simply means we're going to neither either address it in the polishing stage or do another application. No damage has been incurred by the sword and all of the detail in the inscription is still perfectly visible. Let's now move on to the obverse side and repeat the process. So I'm just going to mark where we're going to and we will repeat the process again. I have some fresh hot agar EDTA solution here. It is fluid once again, so we should get some pretty good adhesion. Now, given the results of our preliminary experimentation, I'm not afraid to apply a lot of gel very quickly and have it flow over the edges, because we've seen that it doesn't seem to have a negative effect on good and healthy steel. So if it does flow over the edge, all that's going to do is prevent oxidation from contact with air, and it's not going to negatively impact this process. While I'm here, I'd like to have a little discussion about something, because if there are any museum curators among you, or people who watch restoration content frequently from reputable sources, you will likely have come across the term reversibility. And especially in art restoration, reversibility refers to the concept that any restoration that's done, any work that's done on an artifact, should be able to be reversed without damaging that artifact. In the context of art, this means the use of synthetic isolation layers before you apply any protective varnishes or apply uh, retouching. And in the context of iron artifacts, it might mean the use of a, an artificial resin with mica powder suspended in it to look like fake gilding, which can be dissolved away as seen in a recent, I believe, Metropolitan Museum of Art video of Adam Savage. In this case, however, we're dealing with corrosion. This is not going to be a reversible process because we want to remove this corrosion. And there's a very simple reason why, in the case of iron artifacts, it is allowable to use non-reversible techniques in some particular circumstances. And that's the fact that corrosion inevitably gets worse. If you do not deal with corrosion by stabilizing it, removing it, or otherwise inactivating it, you will, over the centuries, reduce that artifact to nothing. Even if it is stored well in a dehumidified cabinet with materials that do not off-gas, it will eventually degrade, simply because the oxygen in the air is going to react with the steel over time and in the end, there will be no steel left, there will only be iron oxide. So, this is not going to be a reversible process. It is not intended to be a reversible process. It is intended 
to stop further degradation and therefore stabilize the artifact. It is preventative of further degradation of the piece. So no, we're not looking for reversibility here. And if I see you arguing in the comments about reversibility, I'm going to timestamp you this part of the video and remind you that it is rude not to watch the entire video before commenting. All right, we've applied a layer of generous proportions onto the obverse side of the portion which we just treated. We're going to come back in roughly an hour or two because that's how long the last one took. I will be checking back more often than that, but I'm not gonna be turning the camera on more often than that. And then we're going to see how this has progressed. I'm going to simply follow along the line of the sword here with my little plastic knife in a way which cannot possibly damage the sword. And I'm going to lift it off this peelable gel. And when we remove this top layer of gel, we should find that it likewise has removed a large majority of the corrosion products. I'm gonna get a pair of gloves on and then we're gonna wipe this down with some alcohol wipes and protect it. Having cleaned up our workspace, we can have a look at the progress for today. What we can see is that there is no longer any active orange corrosion on the treated section of the blade. While it might look harder to discern the lettering for you because of the lowered contrast, that's primarily because the highlights of the areas here which retain some polish are now the same color as the base metal in this portion. So I am going to use this three-in-one machine oil essentially as a temporary protectant. It doesn't make sense to be using something like Renaissance wax in between applications of these treatments because I'm going to be wiping down these sections with isopropyl alcohol again, reapplying the treatments and there'll be a, an edge where there's some contamination of the oil with alcohol. I'm also going to oil the rest of the blade so that it doesn't rust overnight. And I know that that seems counterintuitive because I've already spent so much time removing any oils from the blade with alcohol wipes and because I'm going to be using a rust removal solution on it tomorrow. But the more rust there is, the slower the chemical process is because this is a time-based chemical process. As we come to the next part of the blade, it's going to become necessary to elevate the blade because the height of the hilt means it's inherently on an angle. So I'm going to use these foam blocks to elevate the blade, work on a section from one side, then once that's dry, we'll peel that section and move on to doing it on the other side again with elevating blocks. It's a different approach to what I use on the tip, but the tip is touching the board and the rest of the blade is not. So I'm just gonna put this on the already cleaned area here. And at the end of the calligraphic inscription here, and we will remove the oil in the midsection, leaving it on the back. So as I'm getting more familiar with this process, I'm trying to optimize it a bit better. Rather than removing all the oil on the blade, I'm only going to remove the oil on the section that I'm treating this time. Hopefully, this will prevent any of the drippage or spillover that might occur when using this elevated single-sided approach from occurring. So this might take a couple of alcohol wipes because there's a substantial amount of oil on this. But once it's done and we've dried it off some paper towels, we'll be ready to proceed. While I'm applying this new layer, I would like to apologize for the very nasally character of my voice in this video, but I am coming off of what seems to have been a cold or a mild flu. So you'll have to apologize for my somewhat labored breathing and somewhat nasal voice. It's not normally this way, but 
Life is as it is, and we don't always get a choice in how we sound. As before, the temperature differential and the thermal coefficient of the steel is aiding us in quickly gelling this mixture so it's not running off the edge of the sword. It is staying on the surface that we have targeted. And beyond the peelability, I would say this is one of the other significant benefits of a process like this over a fully liquid workflow. It's very targeted and that makes it ideal for things like antiques and objects of cultural heritage and that entire genre of conservation work. You don't want to be necessarily treating the wrong areas with a indirect or widespread approach if you can keep yourself contained to the areas that need addressing at the time. In the original papers from which I adapted this technique, the objects that they were conserving were a lot smaller than this. So some of their techniques don't quite directly translate to an object of this size. In the case of something like a coin, it's a lot easier to conserve the entire thing at once, or at least a whole side of it at once, and leave it for an extended duration of time. But in this case, because it's such a, a long object, it's more practical to work in sections. And while it does increase the overall duration of the process, because I keep having to come back, clean areas, flip it over and do other areas, there's really no alternative here. Because I do not want to be soaking this in an entire vat of EDTA in the way you'd have to with a vapor rust. That is wasteful, it requires a lot more evaporost, or EDTA, that is to say. And it's also a lot less controlled. While we're on the topic of adapting the techniques of restoration to fit the object, it's probably worth having a discussion about the, the very many ill-advised restorations you can find on this website on YouTube. Because if you search for sword restorations, the majority of what you're going to find is going to include people using abrasive paper, grinding wheels, wire brushes, uncontrolled electrolysis, media blasting, and a range of other techniques which are totally unsuited to an antique. In fact, one that we often find is people completely removing original components of what they call an antique and replacing it with new components, such as completely replacing a hilt. This is inappropriate for antiques in a way that is obvious to anyone who does work with antiques, but for everyone who might be checking in who isn't in this world most of their life, it's not a restoration if you're modifying the original parts of the sword to that extent. It's not restoring to completely change the character of a sword. To restore is to take something back to a previous state. So in this example, I'm trying to return it to a state closer to how it was a couple hundred years ago. I'm not trying to make it brand new and shiny. I'm not chasing every piece of corrosion all the way to the very end. And I'm not trying to polish it to a mirror shine. Likewise, I haven't looked at the hilt and decided that it is too rusty to recover or that it would be too much work simply because it's a complicated shape and therefore decided to replace it. While many of these YouTubers will have decided that they would like to replace the hilt. And I know that this is all done in the interest of getting more views. Even views from people who are outraged by their techniques. But you're not going to see any of that on this channel. I am going to be attempting to use the very best practices I can based on recent studies and papers which are appropriate to the use in antique arms and armor. Some of them won't be from the world of antique arms and armor, but so long as they include information on ferrous artifacts, then that's the information we're going to be using. And I have consulted with other people in the space of antique restoration before, for example, Woods Militaria. I have a Indian Golia, a heavily curved toolbar, which I talked to them about on their approach 
to treating an object in its condition. So I'm not working in a vacuum here. I do have advice from people who have been professionally conducting restorations for a relatively long amount of time. All of that is to say that YouTube clickbaiters might make for a more interesting and engaging video if you don't actually care about the process of restoration or about the object being restored or indeed about being truthful, honest and not misleading to your audience. Because many of them will label what they're doing as antique, restoration or even just restoration in general when what they're doing is modification of modern objects. Now, doing this single-sided approach, which I discussed earlier, does mean that we're having a bit of trouble with getting it to perfectly adhere to the edge without causing drops. And there is one drop right here that I'm going to address in a moment. But apart from that, it would appear that we have indeed covered the vast majority of the top surface of this antique. Another thing you'll note if you're watching this video and you've been a regular viewer of my channel is that this is a much longer video than most of mine. In most cases, I would have skipped through all of this and given you a 5 minute or 10 minute ultra cut to show the entire process. But I thought it would be better to explain all of my thinking in this so that if you do have an antique in need of restoration, you might understand why this is an appropriate method and using something like sandpaper might not necessarily be. The, the goal here is not only to demonstrate the method I am using, but to discourage people from using ill-advised restoration methods that can damage objects which are inherently a piece of our cultural history. Material culture should be preserved and not wantonly destroyed even if an object is relatively common. Because while it might be common now, in a thousand years long after we are dead, it might be exceedingly rare because no one thought it was worth conserving. So I'm going to treat every object I have, no matter how recent, as though it is worthy of a full comprehensive and ethical conservation doesn't matter about their value, it doesn't matter about their historical significance. What matters is that they are objects of cultural history, they are our material history, and therefore they should be preserved. So I'm just going to use my little plastic knife here to remove that one drop of over-application that occurred and move it back onto the blade. Apart from that, it appears we have been very clean in our application. And now all we must do is wait. Some time has elapsed and we have a rather significant amount of conversion occurring. If you look here or here, you'll see that two of the larger areas that were affected by corrosion have diffused into the gel matrix and we now have iron oxide or ferric oxide suspended in this gel. So as before, we'll take our discard container, we'll take our plastic knife, and we're just going to lightly peel off this gel. Now you'll note that I'm not actually touching the sword in order to protect it with the plastic knife. I'm just using it to lever the gel. As you can see, this is an exceptionally easy cleanup. Um, and I can actually see the calligraphy in the gel let me just get this small bit of drippage that occurred off. And you can see that the finish is quite even with the front portion here, with a slight amount of extra work needed on this area. But overall, we've removed a lot of the corrosion, especially when compared to the untouched areas. I would say that that was a pretty successful application of the gel. Let's clean this up, boil it, and flip it over. Once again, we're using a very generous amount of oil, and we're coming up with a relatively clean piece of paper towel when we're oiling it, so we know that we've done a relatively good job of cleaning off those bits of remaining corrosion in EDTA. So, remember what this looks like as we flip it over, so you compare to the untreated region, which looks like that.
One issue I did note on the last application was that the very edges in the spine were a lot harder to adhere the EDTA to. So I am going to be extra careful to make sure that they are effectively degreased and clean of any residues that could interfere with the binding of the EDTA gel. And I'm going to let this air dry for a little bit while I reheat our agar gel mixture. And that should ensure that it is well primed for cleaning. In case you're curious in terms of the amount of time between these applications and how long it takes, we're looking at roughly one to two hours to get to the stage that we were on the other side of the blade before. I still have some areas of pitting that are visible on this sword. They still have some stable black oxides and it's certainly possible to completely remove all of them. And it would probably be advisable to do so for extremely long-term storage in terms of museums or in terms of collection you intend to have inherited and you know passed down for literally hundreds of years. It would probably be best for the survival of the artifact to go all the way and remove all of the corrosion products. Because this will be in my personal collection and I will be observing it for however many decades more, I am going to leave some signs of age and I am going to remove a reasonable amount of the corrosion products. But if there are some very small amounts of stubborn pitting that do not want to come off, I am not going to use more aggressive methods that may damage the steel in, in order to remove them. I would prefer to use these slow and careful methods and do more applications than to use a more aggressive method that could damage the object. As I've said, this has a calligraphic inscription and I would like to preserve that as much as possible as well as the artistic inscription that we'll be getting to at the end. In terms of how these decorative elements were created, they are created by acid resist etching. So a resist was painted onto the areas that were intended to be left high and the rest of it was not painted with a resist and then an acid was applied. So even in the creation of this blade, etchants were used. So this is really not a, um, not an inappropriate method just in terms of keeping to the spirit of the object because it was already etched once. Uh, once the acid resist etching is completed, the resist is washed off and then you have raised sections which have not been etched and depressed or lowered sections which have been etched. It's a very common method and it was more common in Europe at first before being picked up in these regions where they typically used more traditional engraving styles and inlay styles. So Iran, for example, used a lot of true inlay, it used a lot of kofgari, and it used a lot of chisel decorations. Whereas this is etched. But around 1750 to 1800, we see a very large number of these etched blades coming out of Iran. So there was clearly a, a shift towards using the more economical process on more common blades, while the very high-end ones continued to use things like true inlay. So this is not a particularly high-end example. It's not crucible steel. It's essentially a mono steel. Um, whether that's produced in a blast furnace and refined, so finery steel or some other form, I can't tell because, as I said, I don't have a metallurgical microscope set up here. But, remains to be said, this is not a particularly high-end object, even though I'm treating it with a lot of care. And as I've said before, I will continue to treat every object in my collection with the same amount of care, regardless of whether it is a very expensive and very historically valuable sword or whether it is not because all objects are equally worthy of attention and care in their preservation. While we're here waiting for this gel to react let's discuss a little bit more about this object itself because unlike most Kaja era revival swords as they're often called 
This one has an edge and is thick enough to be usable. The majority of these swords are mostly made for their decorative value, and as a result, they don't have an edge, they're not designed to take an edge, and their inscriptions come all the way to the edge of the blade. In this case, both on the Yelman and on the leading edge, we have a small area which is not decorated at all. And it is this area here that is where the normal edge bevel would be. And this one is in fact pretty close to being decently sharp. That's despite probably never having been intentionally sharpened by a later owner, that's simply the way it was made. Because we don't see any disruption in the, the, the surface texture where that edge is that indicates that someone was using, for example, a whetstone to sharpen it. So while this is mainly a decorative sword made mainly for the festival of Ashura and the commemoration of the Battle of Karbala, it is a functional weapon if you chose to use it that way. It's seemingly a decent high carbon steel with very minimal inclusions. It's a clean steel. It is heat treated and it is decently sharp. Its geometry is also pretty good. It starts at around seven millimeters thick at the Tang and ends up being somewhere in the range of three millimeters thick at the Yelman. So in every way, this could be a functional sword. It just happens to be a heavily decorated object. And that's something we tend to see with even the so-called hunting tulwars and other heavily etched swords of this era from surrounding areas. Despite being heavily decorated, they are still functional weapons. And in Europe we see this too. There are many officers' swords with gilt and blued blades, or etched blades, or even triple etched blades going towards the end of the 19th century, which are still perfectly functional. They're made of high quality steel, they're heat treated, and their geometry is suitable for use. And that's somewhat a different state to what it is today. A lot of the times today, if you see a highly decorated blade, it's stainless. A lot of the Toledo blades we see on the market might be carbon steel, but they're completely solid bars with edge bevels ground onto them. They have no distal taper, their tangs are not designed to be used. So those swords that are valued for their decorative elements don't tend to be well made for functional usage. But in this time period, basically all over the world, even the highly decorated swords were completely functional. And that probably comes down to the fact that this was made in a concurrent industry to functional swords. Functional swords were being made and used at the time by the same industry. It's just that the particular craftsmen doing these etch blades might have been different people. Today, swords aren't used. And so there are pretty large industries making them just as decorative objects because that's all they really can be used for unless you have a blunt designed to be used in fencing or you have a sharp designed to be used in test cutting. We don't go to war with swords anymore. So the value of decorative swords that are only decorative is in their decoration. A significant amount of iron oxide has seeped into the gel at this point. The entire thing has a yellow color and there are areas like here and here where there's relatively thick corrosion that has now turned the gel pink. And these are areas where there's not immediate access to oxygen. In the areas where there is immediate access to oxygen that can dissolve into the gel, we're getting this red discoloration. Regardless, we've reached a point where I'm comfortable removing this layer. So as before, the gel comes off very easily. That's why we're using it. And is very yellow, so we're absorbing quite a bit of iron into it. That is to say, iron oxide, rust. Hopefully that's visible on camera. And we've successfully removed a large majority of the corrosion on this portion. In fact, I'd say we did a very good job. It is well matched with the rest of the treated portion. It's not looking particularly different, which is again, as intended. So let's clean off any remnant gel and then clean it with some alcohol wipes. And while we're doing this, once again, we're not only looking to clean it, but also to mark our progress. So if this looks 
very brown, that's an indicator of the amount of iron we are removing, rather iron oxide. And once again, we're getting a pretty good removal of that rust as evidenced by the discoloration of our alcohol wipes. This is once again time to oil the treated portion of the blade. The rest of the blade is somewhat more complicated to treat because we start having to get under the guard. In the interest of brevity, I've already degreased the blade and we're going to proceed to work on this portion near the hilt in the so-called fort or strong of the blade. The engravings or rather etchings here are of a different character to the rest of the blade. They are typically animal forms and they are finer in detail than the rather wide calligraphic script we see further down. I'm also going to have to navigate around the guard and in order to do that, I'm actually going to cast on this plastic surface a rectangle of this gel. And then I'm going to place that gel once it has started to set on the blade. This is one of the benefits of using a gel rather than a liquid. Because it can be placed and still work after placing, it's going to allow us to create a tailored solution to the fact that we cannot actually access that space that is underneath the guard. So having made a rough rectangle which can be placed on the blade, let's proceed to thoroughly coat the blade up until that point and then we'll be able to place it on that section. Having applied the first layer of gel to the section which is accessible and with this having gelled up a little bit, what I am going to do is prime as much of this area as possible with gel itself so that there will be something for it to adhere to. But I must do that once this is cool and the gel is still hot. So now that this is able to be removed, we can have it prepared on our knife, which we're using as a sort of spatula, and we can prime the area with a small amount of gel. This is essentially acting as a pseudo glue, just to allow us to insert this thin sheet of agar underneath the guard. And it is going to want to stick, but we'll do our best to persuade it. Now obviously the contact that this has with the steel there is going to be less ideal than the contact we've achieved by painting it on the rest of the blade. It is still preferable to leaving that area corroded. And one of the areas the corrosion was worst in was here near the guard, and that's because it's typically inaccessible by normal cleaning methods. Using a gel, as detailed in these papers and in my method that I'm uh, adapting from those papers here, it is possible to treat an otherwise inaccessible area. Like before, this will take between one and three hours, so I will see you again once it's ready for removal, and we'll see how effective it's been applying the gel in a sheet rather than painting it on. I'm going to detach it from this side, and then pull it towards me, so that I can get the gel which is under the guard off, ideally in one piece. So let's begin as per usual with a very light touch. And we've got very good removal of the iron oxide. We have fantastic detail visible in this panel. And it does appear we're able to remove it from under the guard with minimal effort and minimal problems. There we go, not quite in one piece, but pretty good. So if I angle this into the light so that you might see it better, we've actually unveiled an entire portion of the blade which is not visible when it is 
still covered in corrosion. So what looks to be simply brown before restoration is actually figures which have been pretty well preserved and the, the removal with our gel solution has revealed their details quite beautifully. When it comes to cleaning this particular panel and the one on the opposite side, it's going to become very important for us to get our alcohol wipes under the guard so that we don't have leftover EDTA. And likewise, it will be important to let it thoroughly evaporate before oiling it so that that area, which is hard to access, is in fact protected. One good way to visualize our progress as we work on restoring this object is to look at the spine because we haven't applied any, or at least intentionally applied, any EDTA to it. So if I wipe it off entirely, the entire spine is still a pretty even brown color. And when you compare it to the blade on this side, which has been completely restored from tip to hilt, you can see that we've vastly improved the condition of this object without overcleaning it in any particular portion of the blade. So we still have signs of age, we still have some stable black corrosion products, but we've revealed all of the details. We have one more portion of the blade left, and then the real challenge begins when we move on to the hilt. As I clean up this final section of the blade, it should be abundantly clear just how much of the, the under langet area here is corroded below the cross guard. And that is where we saw a very large improvement with the previous treatment. So not only is this treatment safe and clearly suitable for this sort of artifact, it is also very effective even when it's applied as a panel. So we're going to be making another panel. As before, I'm just going to lay out some gel on my little grid pattern I have here, which, if you're curious, is indeed a metric grid. These are all one by one centimeter squares. So you can get an idea of the scale of things. And that does make it a little easier for me when I'm preparing these grids, because I can go for a roughly five by four centimeter grid, and I know that that'll roughly fit onto this section. Once again, we're going to be using some of this still hot liquid agar gel as a glue. So I'm going to apply it to the areas which I can reach safely without touching the underside of that langet. And then I'm going to lift this rectangular section of gel which we've laid like so. And then we're going to attempt to lay it down with as little tearing as possible. And that's gone much better than last time as I've gotten better at handling the gel. And I'm just going to try and push it down to get as many air bubbles as possible out. And hopefully gravity will do the rest of the work for us. When it comes to the hilt, which is our next part of the restoration, I'm probably going to swap to a thicker gel mixture. And that's because I want it to stay on the hilt when the hilt has some semi-complex details. It's not the most complicated hilt, but it's also a lot more complicated than the blade is in terms of shapes despite being undecorated. So we will be adjusting our recipe to fit the needs of the artifact, rather than simply relying on the same recipe the whole time, even if that would be easier. Sometimes it's important to do things well and not necessarily in the easy fashion, which should be a running theme throughout this whole video, hopefully you have noticed. All right, we've sufficiently covered our entire area of interest, and we'll be back in a couple hours. As you can no doubt see, if you haven't alt tabbed out of this video, the last application of gel that we used dried out, 
and that's probably because I've reheated this batch a couple too many times and a lot of the water has evaporated. So our concentrations have increased and so we're getting precipitation of our agar or EDTA onto the surface of this gel. But we do have our layer of ferrous oxide in the gel has reacted with the oxygen at the edges where it's most accessible. So we have had some conversion of the iron. Tomorrow will be the hilt and we will make a fresh batch of gel for that. But until then, we have once again successfully removed a lot of the corrosion products on this sword. However, we are having a bit more trouble with removing the gel simply because it is crumbling. It's not particularly weaker, but it is covered in poorly adhered dry gel. So I'm just going to undercut it here where it is laid on rather than applied with the paintbrush and remove it. And our corrosion removal in this section was slightly worse that time but it is still a, an improvement over how it was. I have a fresh batch of 5% EDTA agar mixture here, which has been heated the requisite twice, from 50 degrees when I first made it, to 95 degrees, back down to room temperature, and then back up to 95 degrees. It is currently very hot and very fluid, and we are going to be using it on the hilt. I've very thoroughly degreased this hilt to the best of my abilities, so we should get a pretty good reaction here um, because we've removed all the oil that would have inhibited this agar from working. I did take a photo of a small spot here on the guard where some of the closer to original finish is visible because most of this has a thin incrustation of active corrosion, whereas here we can see how it would have looked originally. And before I start on conserving this sword, I would like to demonstrate with my other example that these were typically in the white. That is to say, the hilts were polished. You can see that this one has got corrosion on it, but it was originally quite polished. And the same can be said for the one in Krakow that I showed pictures of earlier and was featured in a Jan Mateko painting. So we are going to be treating this as though it should be in the white. And we're also going to be treating it as though this corrosion is going to eat it because that is reality. Iron corrosion does not form a sacrificial oxide layer and will continue to eat the object over time. This portion of this object is already the most heavily corroded and that's because it was exposed to the elements while the blade might have been in something like a scabbard. So this is a thicker gel than our previous one, and we're doing that in the hopes that on these more complicated shapes, it is able to stay, and the, the fluid cohesion will allow it to form a, a good thick layer so that enough active ingredient can act on this much thicker corrosion. And because this steel likely has a different chemistry, to the blade being probably not high carbon and potentially even being of a different manufacturing type, for example, blast furnace versus bloomery, we are going to get a slightly different reaction rate. So we will have to watch this carefully and observe for when we see the telltale signs that this is taking effect. Now, because I've protected the blade with plastic wrap, I'm going to be fairly generous when applying this and not overly cautious about spillover because not only is this blade covered in plastic, it is also elevated. So any drippage we get shouldn't fall onto the back side of this guard, but should instead fall onto the table. One thing I have done with this batch of agar is substantially increase the volume I made because I expect a lot of it will drip onto the table given the curved nature of this one piece steel guard. Another thing I'll note is that this guard is potentially brazed at some point. Could also be forge welded but I'm not sure everything is pretty much hidden with corrosion and if it is brazed there is a chance for galvanic corrosion to occur 
at the transition point between two different metals that have two different reactivities. We're limiting that by using EDTA instead of an acid. And we're also not using electrolysis, which would cause even faster accelerated galvanic corrosion. Because we're using a chelator, which essentially uses a receptor ligand binding system, we're alleviating a lot of the concerns we might normally have doing this sort of work. I mentioned when I was working on the blade that I might have to do a consistency pass, a finishing pass to even out the finish. And I said that that would be contingent on the surface condition once I finished applying all of the gel. Now that we have applied all of our desired gel layers, I can say that we probably won't need a consistency pass because there are very consistent levels of cleaning across the entire object. So we aren't going to have to apply a dilute layer across the entire blade all at once in the hopes that it will even out any differences in the level of conservation and treatment effectiveness because it is all relatively even and you can't discern where one panel started and another panel ended in terms of gel panels. So we've been very fortunate in that and that's probably down to having used the same chemistry for every successive batch of gel that we've used and very consistent timings. Once again, I'm applying a thicker than usual layer of the gel here. And that's because the thicker the gel is, the more active ingredient we have. But also because we're using a more viscous solution this time. And that means that the EDTA is going to have a harder time reaching the steel in order to be able to access it. In a more fluid solution, you get better dissolution of that EDTA and better dissolution of the ions of iron in the, the, the gel. With a thicker solution, like this one, you're going to get significantly worse dissolution of that iron because you have a less aqueous solution. But regardless, we are going to attempt to compensate for that reduction in efficiency with an increase in volume. I'm not sure how long the hilt is going to take in comparison to the blade, because the corrosion here is much thicker and of a different sort to what we saw on the blade. This is a, a deep brown corrosion, where a lot of what we saw on the blade was either black or orange, with relatively little in between. So we had either already relatively stable products or relatively fugitive unstable products. This is somewhere in between, but it's a lot thicker. So I'm going to have to observe this closely and it might be a different time interval to usual. So once this is ready, I will check back and we will attempt to remove it. It's probably going to be harder to remove than the blade because this is a curved shape with internal corners and other complexities. So I'm gonna check back with you when it's appropriate and we'll continue with this conservation. So I've exchanged the gel once already. It came off yellow, but there was relatively minimal effect on the hilt itself. What I have done is added about half a gram of oxalic acid per 100 milliliters to our gel mixture. And that has had two major effects. The gel is more paste-like now because agar doesn't like acidic conditions but that does make it easier for it to be applied to this hilt shape and it is still setting up into a gel as you can see it doesn't flow and the other thing that the oxalic acid does as discussed in the original paper is act as a mild acid so we are using oxalic acid in this it has changed the color texture and flow of the gel and it is hopefully increasing our chemical reactivity of the gel on the steel because otherwise this is going to require far too many applications to be feasible and with a braised structure like this and so much moisture there is a risk of evaporated moisture getting inside the two shells of this braised guard. The gel has acquired quite a bit of color so we know it's absorbing rust or corrosion from the hilt. So it's about time that we exchange the gel because there's only so much it can do per application before it gets pretty much saturated. We also want to check regularly so we don't go too far. So 
let's lever it off the stronger attachment point, such as here around the langet, which is the protrusion of the guard towards the blade. And let's see if we can't unveil our progress. So you can probably see from the underside much better that this is very yellowed. And hopefully you can also see that here and here we have brazing lines, which are just like the brazing lines I have on my Kaja straight sword. Now, as you can see, we've still got quite a lot of corrosion on here. So it's going to require quite a few more applications and that's going to take quite a bit of time. We've gone through several exchanges now, as you can tell by our rapidly growing discard pile and the fact that we have quite a bit more reflective steel visible on this hilt. The blade is essentially finished, so we've got it wrapped up. And I'm going to do a double-sided application of gel on this hilt for the final run so we get an even finish. It won't remove all of this staple black oxide, and I'm okay with that. The intent is to leave some signs of age. In terms of signs, we can see signs of construction. Along the entire edge of these two panels of steel, there is a brass braze line. So this was brazed with brass like my other example. We can also see a few spots where the langets and the quillons have been attached. And there are also some lines that indicate this might have originally had some engravings, but we'll see them better after this final application. I'm going to show you what it looks like on the other side and you'll see that there's relatively similar condition on both sides at the moment. So it is probably an appropriate moment to use a double-sided approach. I've made sure the blade is well wrapped for this because we're going double-sided and I'm going to let it just set before flipping it because otherwise it's just going to run off. It has been thoroughly cleaned between applications including under the guard which had a rather large amount of clay-like residues um, whether that's what was used to affix the guard or whether that's simply the consequence of neglect, there was a rather large amount of orange clay under the langets, which I've removed with this dry clean brush. So like always, we are beginning with a relatively thin layer and then we'll be building vertically up on top of that as the gel cools and it becomes possible to thicken the layers. I don't want to bring this all the way to a like new condition. I would still like to keep some of the black stable oxides because those are extremely slow acting in terms of degradation of an artifact, especially when you cover them with something that prevents further oxygen, like Renaissance wax that is reversible and designed to protect steel or ferrous objects. The oil that I've been using during this isn't particularly suitable to long-term storage because oil runs off and oil also traps dust that falls on it because it is a sticky liquid and even as it evaporates it remains sticky. Something like a microcrystalline wax, like Renaissance wax, is not sticky or tacky and thus does not trap dust. And the issue of trapping dust is that dust is hydroscopic. That is to say, it will absorb water into it, and then that water will be in contact with the blade, and that can cause rust. And after all of this work, and several days of it, we don't want this blade to require further conservation. We would like to minimize the amount that it is exposed to any further restoration or conservation by ensuring that the work we do lasts and so that means we're going to need to use something like Renaissance Wax at the end of this. Now that the majority of the gel has had a chance to set, let's flip this over and do the other side so that we're not delaying the application for too long and we don't get an inconsistent result. You can see that there's been a little bit of dripping and normally I cut that off once the camera's off and that prevents it reacting with the other side, so I just run a knife along the entire brazing edge. But this time we are attempting a double-sided application 
in order to achieve the most consistent result possible. And so we are not going to cut those off because gel is gel, so it's fine if it's dripped on and not been brushed on. Likewise, as I'm applying it to this side, it is going to drip on the other side, but that is okay because there is already gel there. We have finally reached the stage where it appears that the hilt is ready to be on masks for the last and final time. The yellow colour is quite widespread and there are hints of stronger oxidation on points like the end of the langet and the end of the quillon. So I am going to cut the sword free of its agar gel casing and hopefully we've finally succeeded in removing the majority of the corrosion from this hilt. Because this isn't flat like the blade, every removal ends up tearing, and that's frankly inevitable when dealing with a shape like this. And I'm going to clean this up off screen because it still is covered in lots of little bits of gel, and I'll rejoin you after I've cleaned it with a bit of alcohol. I've gone through a couple of packets of these alcohol wipes and some paper towel and a lot of the very superficial oxidation that is caused by the chelation process has come off. Um, so the shine you see here is just from a little bit of buffing with the back of these paper towels. It's now time to oil it and we will get a change in the color once we apply oil, it will likely increase the contrast and bring back a lot of the visible pitting. And you can see that we've lost a lot of that sheen we just had from buffing, so it was very superficial. But we have gained contrast in all of the dark stable oxides that are present on this hilt. So if I just move this into the center of the camera's view, you should be able to get a better idea of how it actually looks now that we've finished our attempt at conservation. Now I will confirm what I conjectured before. There are lines here on the cross guard which appear to be perhaps very shallow etchings or engravings. There's two or three lines that converge down onto the langet. while those are not present on this side of the sword. So they might be a manufacturing detail of this steel. It could be something like wrought iron, and that's why we've got some sort of detail, some texturing in the steel. Or it could have simply had something akin to Kofgari hatching or some very shallow engraving. But that's the only place we can see any remnant of it. We can, on this side, see a place where two steel pins have been brazed in place to hold the entire construction together. But that, at long last, concludes the process of conserving and, to an extent, restoring this sword. What we've essentially done is removed the accessible oxides that were on this sword, that is to say the relatively unstable and active oxides, while leaving some of the more stable oxides on the sword. We've not lost any detail in the etching, and indeed, even manufacturing marks, like some scratches near the tip that I'll include photos of, are still present on the sword. An indicator of the, the quality of the work done here is that we've not lost any details in the calligraphic inscription, despite them spanning the entire blade on both sides. We've also not restored it to the point where it looks newly made. There are still signs of age, which are important because you do not want to be restoring an object with 150, 180 or 200 years of history to look like it has none at all.